Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Nadia and I wanted to share some thoughts with you guys. It's been about a week since my family and I have returned from Disneyland in Paris. And throughout the week, I've been thinking quite a bit about our, our stay there. We stayed for five days at a Disneyland hotel. And um, some of the conversations that my family and I had while we were there were very much on, I think, health, uh, very much health focused because that's just the kind of family that we are. I have a 12 year old and a nine year old. My nine-year-old is more oblivious to all of this, but I think my 12-year-old is starting to question a lot of things, particularly, um, you know, probably her own health at this point in time and, and uh, aesthetics and, and everything else that's probably um, pretty common around that age. I, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you guys about, I, I've, I fear that um, some of the things that I may say, um, you may take offense to. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background and some disclaimers here. I do make a lot of cultural references and that's because I am a people watcher and I am a student for life. I, the reason why I like educating people so much and the reason why I've always loved being a naturopathic doctor for 20 years and now a health consultant for the fasting method is because I have this immense opportunity to learn every single day from all of you and the world around me. And I really um, love to take that opportunity and share as much of it with the rest of, uh, of, the rest of you as I possibly can. So um, doctor in the original sense of the word, the Latin uh, meaning of, the, of doctor was teacher, right? But really I think that I would rather uh, describe myself more of, of a student probably, but also a vector. I, I think that I do, uh, I have a lot of um, pleasure in, in not only learning from people, but really sharing my thoughts. And that's all I'm trying to do today. I'm really just trying to share my thoughts uh, of all the things that I observe and all the things that I, I believe that I, I learn and I, I wanna share with you guys. So what I'm hoping that you get from this uh, little video today uh, it's just some thoughts for me and hopefully absolutely zero offense whatsoever. Although I've, I'll be mentioning a lot of cultural references and even body references, there is absolutely zero body shaming or and, and there is a lot of generalization in all that I'm saying, only in the hope that we can all um, learn from each other, right? And my, my idea is that if we could all just absorb all the best that we possibly can from all the different cultures, all the different people in the world. And if we could all learn from each other, that would be um, the ideal situation. And that's what I'm trying to do. The other thing is that I do believe I have this added advantage, which is that in the last, uh, well, really for the 45 years of my life, I have lived in three different continents in three different countries. And I'm also of mixed heritage, which means that I have a very sort of personal, um, experience in living and interacting with people of different cultures and I actually um, appreciate that very very much. I was born in Mozambique which is a South uh, uh, East African country of Portuguese heritage. Uh, it's a former Portuguese colony so I personally have Portuguese heritage but obviously it's an African country so there's the African influence. There's also a huge um, Asian influence in Mozambique, particularly the Indian influence. And so I do think that I have a very personal, um, more in-depth knowledge of certain cultures. And so it's, it's an opportunity to share that uh, with people. But I've also learned quite a bit because I lived over 20 years in North America. I was raised in Canada and I uh, now live in, in Portugal. So I've lived in Africa, I've lived in North America, I've lived in Europe. Uh, in each of these places, I've lived and worked for over 10 years. So all that I am uh, trying to share with you today is hopefully an opportunity um, and, and hoping that that you all feel and, and extract as much as I feel like I have learned from other people and abstracted from other people. So. The references that I'm making here, what does this all have to do with Disneyland? Well, Disneyland, Paris, is the only Disneyland in all of Europe. So you have this immense opportunity of having this large pool of individuals from all different European countries. And Europe is, is a very interesting place because it's a very diverse place. I, I believe people in Portugal and Spain and the Mediterranean to be a bit more similar, but then uh, people start to vary quite a bit throughout the rest uh, of Europe. Particularly, I think that 
we can not not just in genetics there's a uh, you know, people in Portugal uh, generally tend to be of st shorter stature, you know, a bit leaner, maybe more dark, darker skinned, whereas people in Northern Europe tend to be, you know, taller and, and more fair skin. And so besides the obvious genetic differences in that regard, there's a lot of cultural differences as well. So here are some things that I think that we can observe and extract from, from all of these different cultures and habits. One of the things that my daughter pointed out to me while we were in Disneyland, and again, I, I'm saying all of this in the hopes that there will be zero offense taken and realizing that I'm making a lot of generalizations here for the purpose of, of uh, trying to extract some useful information, practical information for our own lifestyle. And so one of the things that my daughter observed and, and pointed out, and this keep in mind particularly because she's very self-aware of her own body and her own health, as I said, and because my husband and my children uh, do have a tendency for obesity uh, and insulin resistance from a very young age, as I believe I did as well, but I'm the lean type. So I am like many people out there that we refer to as being tofi, so thin on the outside and fat on the inside. I did develop fatty liver very early on, even when I was very thin. I developed a frank type of PCOS, even though I was very lean at the time. Uh, my children, on the other hand, both my children and my husband have had a tendency towards obesity since they were children. And so I think my daughter's trying to sort of process this whole uh, thing in her mind. And because we live in Portugal right now, I think that what she mostly observes around us is that people, particularly people her age, tend to be very, very uh, lean and thin. And so, although I, I think that globalization is having an impact all over the world and people are being uh, influenced by other cultures, uh, culinary um, habits and whatnot, I think traditionally in Portugal, people still do follow a very traditional Portuguese type of cuisine and habits. Uh, same with Spain and Italy and Greece, although as I said, this is being influenced and, and globalized in a way. But what my daughter noticed while we were in, in Disneyland Paris is that a lot of the Portuguese, Spanish, Italian people that were there were generally very lean. Um, and people from other parts of Europe uh, particularly she noticed, and, and because we can understand some of the languages, you know, we, we did notice that there appeared to be a lot more people from the UK with a visibly type of uh, morbid obesity, you know, either both parents or one of the parents. And again, I am really hoping that uh, people don't take offense to, to what I'm saying. I think if we do look at the statistics throughout the world, we're aware that people in North America have a higher um, tendency for obesity. I think Mexico as well. Um, in Europe, you know, I, I don't know exactly where the UK ranks as far as, as obesity. I could have looked this up, but I really just wanted this to be from the heart and from observation and what it is that uh, we can extract from this. So anyway, my daughter said, you know, why is it that uh, people in Portugal are, there, there doesn't seem to be as many obese people as, for example, um, you know, the families that we're seeing here from the UK, not just the parents, but sometimes even the children, which is very unusual uh, in, in Portugal to see obese uh, kids. Um, at this point, you still don't see a lot of obese children in, in Portugal and Spain and, and France and Italy. And so one of the things that I know personally, you know, having been uh, raised uh, and lived in all of these different countries is that, you know, we have this idea that the Mediterranean diet is very healthy, right? And a lot of us, if we were asked, you know, why is the Mediterranean diet so healthy? We would probably say, well, it's because they eat olive oil or, you know, whatever other thing that we, and so the rest of us may walk away just thinking, oh, if I just eat however I eat or how, if my family were to continue to eat, the, the exact same things that we normally eat and we add a little bit of olive oil, maybe that's going to be uh, the key difference. And I do believe that extra virgin olive oil has a lot of really great and healthy properties, but I think it goes a little bit beyond that. So I just wanted to, to share some of the thoughts that I've been sort of putting together over the last week as I've been thinking about this. And really the one thing that I know for certain is that people in countries like Portugal, Spain and Italy, 
you know, Monday to Friday, if not Monday to Sunday, they still are very much in the habit of eating home cooked meals um, and, and whole food type of meals, whole food ingredients. What, what does this mean? This means that they mostly generally still cook from scratch, not just homemade, but even the seasonings and the sauces, and this really is the take home message for me today. The seasonings and the sauces that people in these countries still generally use are homemade one ingredient type of things. For example, let's talk about salad dressings. Salad dressings in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, in Greece, still tend to be, and I know this for a fact, even if you go to restaurants, this is still what you are eating, are salad dressings that are made with olive oil, um, lemon or vinegar, a little bit of uh, salt and pepper, and some spices, okay? Very much so. So much so that for these people, it is, uh, they don't really enjoy having salads with the types of sauces and dressings that people in North America and possibly the UK um, are used to and enjoy uh, using. For example, Caesar salad dressing and ranch dressing and even using uh, sauces such as barbecue sauces that people in North America and the UK and other places uh, love to to enjoy with their with their grilled meats for example this is not a habit that people in uh, Portugal Spain Italy and Greece and countries like this uh, are used to doing and even enjoy it, it really does take away from the you know type of recipes that they that they love and enjoy and I know this for you know for as I said more of a personal reason my grandfather for example when we used to travel together you know it was very strange for him uh, to, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able, he, my grandfather, my grandmother, they wouldn't be able to, for example, enjoy a salad with any kind of, uh, of these types of, um, you know, bottled types of, of dressings. So one of the main things that I really have been reflecting on, and these are things that I've known since I was a, a, a you know, a young, a younger person, is that Growing up in North America, I did grow up really enjoying these more highly palatable processed types of dressing, sauces, mixes, whether we're talking about eating, you know, Mexican food with certain sauces or wh whatever uh, other food that North Americans are used to eating. We really, as North Americans and probably people in the UK, which have a more similar sort of um, dietary taste or, or habits, I think that these highly processed, it's not just the fact that they, but also the fact that they have, whether you're looking at this from the calorie point of view or the carb point of view, they have higher calories, higher carbs, but highly processed in very different types of oils. So the oil really is a big thing. I think that using, um, olive oil as the base, extra virgin olive oil as the base of your sauces, whether it's for cooking, for seasoning, it really does make a big difference as opposed to these um, highly processed seed and vegetable oils. I think this is a big, big thing. I know you've been hearing probably a lot about this, but I do think that not only does this make a big difference for us, but this is something that is being passed on from generation to generation. So even though I am, you know, second generation, um, uh, you know, immigrants, uh, Portuguese Canadian or African Canadian or whatever you want to call them. This is something that I have still uh, not only absorbed and learned from my culture, but I am hoping to pass on uh, and have uh, hopefully passed on to my children. However, I'm passing on a bit of a mixed culture because it's not that I don't enjoy the sauces, the highly processed, highly palatable sauces, but at least I'm aware of the difference and I am able to enjoy my salads and most of the time I do enjoy my salads with this olive oil uh, and vinegar type of base dressing. So this is something that is very, very practical. This is something that you can change in your own life. You can try to adapt to your own life, but also that you can pass on to future generations. So not only how you season your salads, but how you uh, cook and how you enjoy your, your meats and fish, for example, you know, again, in these uh, Mediterranean countries, uh, they do consume um, a lot of fish and seafood, but usually grilled with a little bit of lemon and olive oil and salt. And really, no, uh, none of these uh, processed, uh, highly palatable sauces. 
the, you know, I, I spoke about the meats, for example, you know, I think grilled meats is something that's worldwide. Uh, I think every culture, probably from the Korean culture to, you know, European cultures to African cultures to um, North and South American cultures enjoy their grilled meats, uh, but different cultures will enjoy it uh, with a side of different things. So one of the main things that I know certain cultures consume a lot of, again, is these highly palatable, mostly processed barbecue type sauces, where, whereas in, you know, South American, uh, particularly Brazil, which is a, a culture that consumes a lot of grilled meats in, in parts of Brazil, uh, Portugal, not so much, but when they do consume grilled pork, for example, it's always seasoned with just lemon and salt and uh, you know the, the the natural fat of the pork. So I, I do think that having reflected on this, and if there's one thing that I wanna share with you guys, that's probably gonna make a significant uh, difference in your life and the life of you know the generations to come. If you were to pass anything on uh, of significance, this I think would be one big, huge one when it, when it comes to uh, how you cook your foods, how you, uh, enjoy your foods. I think the biggest challenge with this is that if you've grown up uh, used to these highly palatable, very processed, very addictive types of flavors, it is a challenging thing. It is hard to transition, but I think that it's something that is definitely worth it. We are animals of habit. We do get used to and truly enjoy the things that we are used to eating. So I do think we can change our habits. As Coach Terry in our program always says, you know, we can do hard things. We've always done hard things and we can do this as well. Okay, so I really did wanna share this with you guys. I hope you find it useful that it gives you some food for thought. All right, everyone, take care, bye.